Hello and a warm welcome. I'm Armin Trost, professor at the Furtwangen University in Germany. And this is my series on human resources strategies, a real master course for advanced HR students, professionals and executives. This series is available on YouTube and on all podcatchers like iTunes or Spotify. All slides that support this series are available on my website. For more information, please read the description to this YouTube or podcast. I'd also like to refer to my book, Human Resources Strategies, available at most online bookstores. So, again, thanks for listening. Have fun and gain valuable insights into the fascinating world of HR strategies. When you think about the term career, what comes to your mind? Uh, very often, when we think about career, we think about management career. Climbing up the hierarchical ladder, right? But here's the thing. Very often, in your organization, there are experts, really, which are very critical to your company's success. Very often. I mean, sometimes you might think, okay, if we would lose this executive or if we would lose this executive, that might be a pity, right? But sometimes if you would use, lose specific experts, that would be a tragedy because they possess success critical knowledge. So the question is, why not treating them like, like top managers? Why not? So... We really have to think about these two different types of careers. And also, that's a question for you personally. Do you want to become an executive or do you want to become an expert? Expert means that you're very, very good in something. So let me clear this, clear this uh, in the beginning. Um, as a manager, uh, when, you, when you have power, that means that you have responsibility over some people, yeah? uh, people that report to you. So you have a kind of hierarchy underneath, so to speak. And you are responsible for all these people underneath. Right? And you are responsible for budgets uh, and people, right? But if you are an expert in an organization and you have power, then it's not about responsibility for people. That's not the thing. You, you, you have different power. You, you have power over other people through your knowledge, through your expertise. I mean, I mentioned a couple of times that this podcast is produced during the corona crisis. And I mean, when you think about managers, these are pretty much the politicians. They have power. They have formal power. They sometimes have formal power over a parliament or an entire um, nation. And then there are these experts, uh, the virologists, for instance, and they have incredible power, but they, they don't have power over people. They have power in a country. They have power in a different way. They have power because they have critical knowledge, knowledge that is very, very essential in a given moment. Okay, so experts also have power, but in a different way not through their formal position in an organization, but through the knowledge, which is seen as being critical by others and sometimes even for the entire organization. So when we look at expert careers versus management careers, let's start with management careers. That very often goes like this. I mean, you start maybe like, a, let's say, regular employee, right? You're a regular employee, a starter, a, a fresh from 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 university or, or something like this and then you get promoted becoming a team or project lead department head departmental head or division head and sooner or later you might become a board member and and the far you move the higher you move in the hierarchical pyramid towards the top expert careers very often sound different you might start also as a regular employee, okay, but now you might become a junior expert in something, 
a recognized expert already, you might be very good in something, in a special technical field or in a special um, product related field or uh, a specialist in law or a specialist in something within HR, uh, whatever it is, and then you you get even more important, you become a consultant, senior consultant. And very often in some companies like IBM, for instance, being a fellow, that's the, the top expert in something. The really are uh, the expert with the highest honor, with the highest reputation. Yeah? So, I mean... This idea of expert careers that emerged in the last few years, maybe decades, I would say, it's simply based on, on the idea that experts very often are very critical to an organization, sometimes more critical than executives. But now here's the thing. Um, I very often ask organization, in your organization, why do you offer something like an expert career? Why do you have something like that? Why do you offer an alternative path? Why, why is that there? And um, in Germany, there was a study conducted um, a couple of years ago, and HR executives were asked exactly this question. And uh, the answer that was chosen the most was, we offer expert careers because you want to offer alternative career opportunities to experts within a flat hierarchy. Uh, we want to offer an alternative career or something like, we want to offer perspectives to valuable experts who aren't capable for a management career. I mean, you can imagine this. You have real experts, yeah? good people, smart people. They know a lot about something and they are essential for your organization. You don't want to lose them. Okay, if you don't want to lose them, you have to offer them a perspective. Right? So whatever that might be. And the third point that was mentioned the most was we want to retain key employees. We don't want to lose them. And, and by doing that, and that's the fourth point, we want to strengthen our employer attractiveness. <laughs> so, you know, that's an that's a empirical result that really confuses me. That really confuses me. I mean, some of you m might have heard what I just have shared with you. Offer alternative opportunities, offer perspectives, retain experts, being attractive, all these nice things. I mean, that sounds good. But now I would like to take you uh, another perspective. I mean, think about if I would have asked, if somebody would have asked the question, hey, in your organization, why do you offer something like a management career? Why do you offer a management career? And the answer would be, yeah, you want to offer alternative career opportunities for those who, who are not experts but who want to manage. Yeah, <laughs> we want to we want to do good to to those people who who are good in management but but not good in in, in any particular field. Yeah, we want to retain those people, so we want to offer them something so that they feel valued and so that those who are not experts that they also feel well in the organization right so we want to do good to the people wouldn't that be strange i mean why offering career opportunities just to retain people just to offer perspectives to people is that really what you want to do uh, so here comes a very strategic decision around expert careers that in my eyes is really key here is it that you really want to build career opportunities around experts? Is that what you want to do? Is it that you want to do good to experts? Is it that you want to feel them valued? Or in terms of a strategic statement, you would say, we want to offer important experts who seem unsuitable for management career a development perspective and thereby retain them in the company. Is that really what you want? Or is it something else? And that's the other strategic statement, the opposite one. It's not about experts, it's about expertise. By means of expert careers, we ensure the availability of critical expertise within the company. That sounds different. That sounds different, right? That sounds really different. It's not about the people. 
it's not about that you do something for the people. It's to, to, to have, to possess critical expertise in your organization. That's the idea. That's the idea. It's not about people, right? So this is one distinction I would like to share with you. And there is another dis distinction. Some companies want to do something that I would name mass sports. So here is the strategic statement. All employees above a certain level have the opportunity to pursue a management or expert career. Right? So I mean, after a certain level, you tell the people, hey, you are here in HR, you are here in purchase, you are here in marketing. Now you can choose. Uh, do you want to be more an expert uh, or do you want to go for, let's say, a management career? What do you want? And we offer this career path in any function. Right? Because in any function, we need experts and people who manage. So, hmm? okay. And you offer this to everybody. I know some companies who really did this. And some other companies, they do something that I would name top sport. Right? And the strate strategic statement here goes like this. Only a few selected experts are deprived of expert careers with us. In this respect, we treat this possibility only very selectively. We only have a few, just a few, super experts in our organization. This is, this is what we want to go for, right? Mass sports or top sports. So when you combine these two dimensions that I just have shared with you, do you want to focus on experts, people, or do you want to focus on expertise, the needs? And you combine this dimension, experts, expertise, with a scope, mass sports versus top sports, you're going to get four different types of expert careers. That's pretty cool. I mean, I made a, a, a study, uh, it's already a couple of years ago, and we asked companies, how do you, how do you handle this with the expert careers in your organization? So, uh, uh, we asked various questions, and after having analyzed all those questions, uh, all those answers, actually, uh, we, we understood that there are four different types of expert careers. Probably there are more, but, but these are basic types. Okay, And one thing is that you want to focus on people. Yeah? You tell the people, hey, if you don't want to manage, you could be an expert. Yeah? And you offer this in every function. Right? And uh, it's really about the people. You want to do good to the people. It's, it's, it's the approach treating everybody well. Right? To offer everybody an alternative perspective. If you don't want to become a manager, okay, become an expert. It's cool. Everybody can do this, right? Um, well, some companies focus not on people. They focus on expertise. The expertise is really, really crucial. And these are organizations that really just want experts. They only want experts, really. And they, they have a lot of experts. Maybe they consist of experts. We name this an expert organization. Uh, sometimes uh, companies in uh, professional services, no, consulting, they have just experts. Just experts. Uh, leading people is not the thing here. It's just that you have only experts. And and there is no, uh, just a rare management career very often. Yeah? You have this bunch of experts. And, and that's it. And everybody could be an expert. Everybody is an expert. Yeah? And uh, if, you do, if you do top sports, yeah, and you want to focus on people, then you look in the organization and say, hmm, who are these people which we don't want to lose by any means? Who are those experts, these critical people? People, really, it's a focus on people. And then you say, okay, here are 20 people which we don't want to lose because they are experts. And then you build something around them. You say, okay, these are the experts. So uh, let's have a kind of kingdom for those. Yeah? We build a kingdom around these experts. Right? And some other companies say, no, 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 this is not what we want. It's not about the people. It's about the expertise. Right? We want to make sure that at certain points in the organization, we want to have some expert superheroes. And you really carefully think about where you need this expertise. Probably in some key functions, you want to have the best of the best. Whatever your company is doing, in some areas, you want to have the best experts that you could get in the world. Yeah? But it's, again, I, I also talk about experts, but in the end, what you want is the expertise 
It's the expertise. So you build a position for this. First comes the position, then comes the expert. It's like an in-house professorship. <laughs> this is, this is uh, pretty much comparable to that. Okay. Uh, the professorship idea is, by the way, pretty cool because, you know, that's a good example for, for expert career. I'm a professor. So why did I become a professor? Because I can't manage. <laughs> no, it's not the real answer. And I really, no, I can't manage. I really can't manage. I am not, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a lousy manager. I, I can teach how to manage. <laughs> I can do this. But me, myself, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm not capable of managing people. Really not. Uh, I, I learned this and it's good that I learned this. So, so I want to become an expert. I want to really learn as much as I can about human resource management and about organizational behavior. I mean, that's my, that's my field. And I'm happy when I can go very deep in something and I don't want to lead people. That distracts me from my work. So a professor is really an expert. An ex an, an, a professor must not lead people. But a professor, as you know, has much power. I mean, uh, we share our knowledge and we, we uh, and the people listen to us so very often uh, if we do it well. And, and uh, it's, it's a very powerful position, but not in the sense of that a lot of people report to us. So that's not the point. So, so being a professor, that, that's a professorship. It's a very good example about expert career. Right, I really, I really like this, and it really works. It really works well. Um, so, the question though is, um, how do you manage uh, the influence of an expert in your organization? How do you do that? Um, and sometimes, in, in some companies, as I also learned from my studies. Um, it's that experts have a formal influence. So that means that experts are involved in certain committees, right? So, and they really have a voice, not informally, but formally. And if they say no to a project, the project will never start, right? Sometimes uh, companies have processes where experts play a fundamental key role. And if the if any expert in a certain field can stop a project. Yeah? So to put this into a strategic statement, it's like this. The influence of experts in the company is formally defined. Certain experts are part of certain decision-making bodies and project groups. Hmm? So that's w one way you could go. But the other way you could go is to do something uh, that I would name informal influence. Yeah? Meaning the influence of an expert um, always depends on the expert him or herself. It's like, it's like when you are a professor, for instance. You don't have formal power outside the university. You, you, you have to build your own reputation. And you have to fight for this. And you have to constantly make sure that, that the ideas you have, the insights you have, the research you have done is valuable for whom? Not, not only for the scientific community, but maybe even for society or even for, for economy, right? So it depends on you, yeah? And you can do much or you can do less. And, and, and yeah, you have influence that is defined by yourself and there are no official rules telling okay if this professor says no we don't do it hmm. yeah. so um, put it into a strategic statement means the influence of an expert always depends on the expert him or herself he or she must develop his or her own influence and thus his or her own acceptance and some companies even go further and say, if you don't make it to gain acceptance inside the organization, if the people do not ask you for your expertise, you aren't an expert, an expert anymore in this organization. Right? Like a consultant. A consultant who is never asked for advice is not a good consultant. <laughs> okay? You see it? That's interesting. So... Let me share with you one example that, that is really so, so, so special. Um, and it's, it's a prototypical example, I would say. Uh, it's very, very famous, very well known. And whenever you think about expert career, you must think about this particular case. Uh, I'm talking about the IBM Fellows. That's a, that's, a, that's a cool idea. So the IBM Fellows, that's a program where 
each year, a few people, really just a few, um, between four or nine or something, I think the maximum was 11 in one year, but it's really a few. Just a few people are appointed as being IBM fellow by the CEO, <laughs> by the CEO, by the by the uh, Sun King, <laughs> yeah. So it's very exclusive, yeah. And and being an IBM fellow at IBM, that, that that's the highest honor one might achieve within IBM. So if an IBM fellow visits a subsidiary somewhere at IBM, they roll out the red carpet. Oh, a fellow will visit us tomorrow. These are gods, you know, gods, and 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 that's it's a program that was that was founded by by uh, T Thomas Watson, Thomas Watson Jr. He, he was the son of uh, the founder Thomas Watson, uh, president of of IBM. That was a that was a, a a cool idea. I mean, these were really really gods. Uh, not only inside IBM, they were they were already very very well known outside I IBM. Right? Um, through these um, IBM fellows, they 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 have received five Nobel prizes. I mean, it's a company that has received Nobel prizes. How cool is that? And they generated thousands of patents, scientific articles, and and, and, and all the like. I mean, you can imagine how much that really strengthened uh, and still does the competitive advantage of IBM. Having the superheroes in a certain fields inside your organization. And, and the idea is that these IBM fellows really act like professors. They are completely free. They should not lead people. They should not be supposed to run performance appraisal with their team or something like this or do some, some negotiation about salary and all this stuff. They should not manage. Really not. I mean, they should think. They should think. They should do research. They should produce insights which are relevant for the future of IBM. It's really comparable to to professorships. Yeah, so the, they they really they really have uh, 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 much freedom. Um, so if if you want to have a look, um, and that's that's really a sign that <laughs> all, all the IBM fellows that have ever existed are listed on 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 Wikipedia. Yeah, uh, it's it's pretty cool. I mean compare this to any kind of university i don't know whether on the wikipedia page of 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 harvard whether they are all professors listed that have ever worked there i, I guess not but i have to check <laughs> right so and w with this point of having this freedom acting like a professor inside the organization that touches something that is absolutely essential whenever it comes to expert career it's the matter of of organizational integration so is it, and I put it into a strategic statement, with us, every expert reports to a line manager as do all other colleagues. Accordingly, objective setting is also made with experts. Is it that? So as an expert, I have a supervisor and I do some maybe annual objective setting. I is it that? Or is it more like the IBM fellow thing that you are free, you are absolutely independent? Or to put it into a strategic statement, our experts all report to the CEO and are otherwise independent. This gives them the freedom to make a difference for the company as a whole. I mean, sometimes you see the case that maybe uh, an expert reports to the uh, head of research and development, something like this. That could be. I mean, sometimes we also have it in, in certain functions. I know it, for instance, at HR, that sometimes you have a superhero in somebody, in something, sorry, a superhero in something, in uh, a certain kind of field, uh, let's say uh, labor law or something like this, and this super expert uh, reports to the CHRO. That, 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 that could be, but otherwise it's absolutely independent. That's a that's a fundamental, that's a fundamental differentiation. Why is it that's so fundamental? Uh, it's also fundamental because when you look at experts, and I could take myself as an example, um, these experts very often, they don't want to manage. They don't want to manage and they want to be free. Why, be why did I become a professor? Because I wanted to be free. I didn't want to have a boss who tells me what I'm uh, allowed or supposed to think. No. And when I do this podcast here, 
I don't want to have a boss who tell me, oh, you have to do this episode again. It's not good enough. Or you should not tell this. You should tell this. If there would be a supervisor above myself, I would, I would stop immediately. Uh, really, really. It would drive me crazy. So experts very often want one thing. They want freedom. And they want to have, not only in the sense of being autonomous, but also in a sense of not being distracted by administrative or uh, organizational policies. They just want to do what they love so much. And what do they love so much? They love to deal with problems. They want to deal with complex problems. They want to create new insights. That's what they want to do. So experts very often don't have an, an interest or any ambition to be part of any executive meeting. For them, that's a, that's a waste of time. <laughs> you know? This is not what they want. They also very often don't, don't want these privileges executives share. They don't want to have a big office with thick carpets and expensive uh, paintings on the wall. This is not what they want to have. They want to exchange with good colleagues. This is what they want. And they want to have freedom uh, above everything. Uh, and very often they don't want to be, be seen by everybody. Very often they want to have uh, more, more silence, uh, an area where they can be focused. Yeah? It's very important. But be careful here. Yeah? That's another strategic uh, dimension that I don't want to highlight here too much. Uh, the question really is, do you want to have nerds or not? Yeah. I met a company recently, they made the strategic decision and said, okay, there are some experts in our fields which, which are absolutely critical for us, but we don't want to have nerds. What is a nerd? A nerd is somebody who's extremely good in something, but it does not like to work with people. Uh, and this is not what you might want, but, that, but it's, it's a strategic decision. If you say, well, the only thing that matters is the expertise and anything else does not matter, or you say no. We want to have experts who really can convince others, who can work with others, who can fight, wrestle with others, right? Who can gain this kind of level of acceptance that is necessary to be powerful as an expert inside the organization. Okay, so you see, this is a this is an interesting field. It's an interesting field, and all starts with the question: Why do you want to have something like an expert career in your organization? And if you got this trait, then there are a couple of other questions that you that you better answer as early as possible okay so that's for the moment and that was the last episode around talent development career and so and by next time we're going to start with a very important topic <laughs> then we're going to start talking about money yeah we're going to start about talking about compensation remuneration okay and that's also it's going to be a very very fascinating field i really look forward to this so Thanks for listening and see you next time. Bye.